Good morning and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning for this exciting webinar that we are conducting with our collaborators at Genovac. My name is Vasundhara Behel and I'm a product manager at Gator Bio. Over the next 10 minutes or so, I will be introducing Gator Bio as a company and talking to you about the products that we offer. So some of you are already familiar with who we are, but those of you who aren't, here is a, a brief introduction. Gator Bio is a part of Access Medical Systems, our parent company, which has two branches, Gator Bio and ET Healthcare. Gator Bio is the research use only wing and we offer instruments, consumables, as well as software for research use only. Our user base is spread all around the world. We offer products in North America, Europe, Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. The other wing, ET Healthcare, specializes in diagnostic products, and these products are marketed only in China currently. From here on, this presentation will be focused on Gator Bio products. Here's a brief history of BLI and uh, Gator Bio. Our CEO, Hong Tan, founded Forte Bio back in 2001 and built the first BLI prototype in 2002. In 2006, Forte Bio launched the Octet that many of you are familiar with and many of you have used. In 2018, Dr. Hong Tan, along with Bob Zook, our CTO, founded Gator Bio in Palo Alto as the next-gen BLI company. Currently, we offer three instrument systems, Gator Prime, Gator Plus, and Gator Pro. And these are designed to suit different throughput needs. So we are based in California. Palo Alto is where our headquarters is. Along with our products, our intellectual property portfolio is also pretty strong. We have more than 50 granted patents and our install brace is growing rapidly worldwide. Our R&D team that is housed in Palo Alto, California is developing innovative products every day and our consumables manufacturing also takes place in Palo Alto. Along with this, our team of experienced field scientists and engineers are spread all over the US and some of you have already uh, met some of them. As for applications, our products are suitable for applications like quantitation, kinetics and epitope binning of antibodies. Our products also uh, are suitable for small molecule analysis, gene therapy, and lipid nanoparticle analysis. And here is a picture of our founder, Dr. Hong Tan and Bob Zook, and our director of R&D, Dr. Poo Lee. So first of all, let's go over the principle of BLI. BLI is an optical technique that is used to measure the biomolecular interactions by analyzing changes in interference pattern. So light gets reflected off the surface of a biosensor tip. And when biomolecules bind to the tip of the biosensor, this causes a change in the interference pattern, which is recorded by our software as a nanometer shift signal. So when biomolecules bind to the biosensor tip, that can be seen as a positive change in the nanometer shift. Uh, that is recorded by the software as a positive signal. And when biomolecular interaction uh, breaks or the biomolecules start falling off the surface, that is recorded as a negative nanometer shift. So all this data recorded by our software can be seen in real time as the experiment is being run. So basically these events shown here are seen in real time as the BLI signal.
Our solutions include the Gator instrument, Gator biosensors and consumables, and Gator One software. So it's a complete package that you would need for your antibody development needs or viral vector analytics or small molecule and lipid nanoparticle analysis. Some of the features of the Gator instrument is that, as I mentioned earlier, we have three different systems to suit different throughput and different sample volume needs, starting with Gator Prime, which is our base instrument, then Gator Pro and Gator, uh, Gator Plus, and then Gator Pro, which is the high throughput instrument with 32 spectrometers, so it can, uh, it can analyze 32 samples in parallel. Our systems are compatible with crude samples as well, and these include supernatants, cell lysates, and uh, samples like serum and plasma. And the Gator BLI instrument has no fluidics, so maintenance is really easy. There is no fluidics to clean. There's no issues with clogging and things like that. So it's a very low ma maintenance and a very easy to use instrument. Then coming to our consumables, the picture here shows a glass probe that our, all our consumables are based on. It's the tip of this glass probe that is coated with different chemistries to suit different applications. Two examples are shown here, the protein A probe and the streptavidin probe. So as you can see, the protein A probe is coated with protein A, and this is used for quantitation of different IgGs. And the streptavidin probe is coated with streptavidin, and this is used for analysis of different molecules that are biotinylated. So these are just two examples. Depending on the application, the probe can be coated with many different kinds of proteins or molecules. Here is a list of all of our consumables. So our suite of applications includes antibody characterization and AAV analytics. So for antibody characterization, some of the products are Pro-A, Pro-G, and Pro-L, which are generic sensors to bind to IgGs from various species, and these are used for quantitation. We also have probes specific to, to human FC region, the HFC and the HFC2. These are used for both kinetics and quantitation and can also be used for epitope binning. And here uh, is the dynamic range shown for quantitation. We also have a sensor specific for mouse FC region and for human fab regions. We have sensors uh, coated simply with APS and an amine reactive sensor for those users who wish to play around with surface chemistries a little bit. We have products that are specific for his tagged proteins. So these include our anti-his biosensor and the nickel NTA biosensor. We have a portfolio of four different streptavidin based probes to suit different user needs in terms of uh, size of the molecules that can be analyzed or whether uh, a user is interested in reusing the streptavidin biosensor. So these include the streptavidin, SAXT, SMAP, and the FLEX SA biosensor. Our most recently launched streptactin XT biosensor is specific for proteins fused with twin strept tag, which is, uh, it's, it's gaining popularity recently. The twin strept tag was invented by IBA Life Sciences and um, the streptactin biosensor is specific to this uh, twin strep tag, which can be used as an alternative to his tag in many cases. Our viral vector analytics focuses currently on AAV. So we have four products for AAV quantitation. These differ in terms of their dynamic range. So we have a, a high sensitivity and a regular product for AAVs, all serotypes. And we also have a product for measuring the full versus empty ratios of AAV or in other words, the packaging efficiency of AAV. So this was about instruments and consumables, and then our Gator 1 analysis software that supports quantitation, kinetics, epitope binning, and viral vector analysis. This software is a part of the full Gator package. Uh, it enables real-time monitoring of interference patterns. So as I showed, the, the biomolecular interactions can be observed in real time. And it's a very easy to use intuitive software that helps you set up your assays as well as analyze the data and then helps export uh, data reports in form of Excel files. So this was a brief introduction of Gator Bio, our instruments, consumables, and software. Now I would like to hand over to the team at Genovac 
so that they can talk to you about their exciting research and how they use the Gator BLI platform to enable them in their goals. All right. Thank you, Vazundra. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to have uh, this opportunity here today um, to speak. And um, our presentation will be all about anti-idiotype antibodies or shorter anti-it antibodies. And um, they hold immense significance in the field of immunology, cancer therapy, and autoimmune diseases. And these tiny but powerful molecules play a pivotal role in understanding and manipulating our immune system, uh, especially in bioanalytical and pharmacokinetic applications um, of preclinical and clinical stages. They are a desired tool, for example, for the investigation of anti drug antibodies. An important property, um, especially for PKPD studies, is the high affinity to the target antibody. So today you will learn how Genovac has successfully completed campaigns for the discovery of anti-id antibodies and how we enhanced and expanded anti-id antibody diversity and affinity using our core technology, the genetic immunization. Here is a short outline on what we will cover during this presentation. I'll start by introducing our company and then I will focus on our case study. While I touch on the discovery of antibodies against which we actually generated the anti-id antibodies, the main focus uh, will be on the discovery of the anti-ids, of course. Uh, so we'll explore our immunization techniques, uh, the screening for the specific hits, and the characterization of our recovered hits at the sequence and binding levels. Following that, I'll hand over to Donovan, who will present affinity measurements and competitive binding um, data using the Gata Bio BLI techniques. So I'd say let's get started. Genovac operates, operates um, as a contract research and contract manufacturing organization with locations in Fargo, uh, which is in North Dakota, and Freiburg, which is located in Germany. Uh, we are offering two main services. Um, one is the antibody discovery part, where we are employing various immunization strategies and accommodating multiple species including uh, wild type and transgenic hosts, as well as human PBMCs. And we offer a broad range of screening platforms, such as the Hybridoma and the Beacon platform, uh, which can be complemented uh, with hit, hit expansion using 10x and sequencing through either Sanger or the NGS technologies. Our second core area revolves around the production and the characterization encompassing services such as binding kinetics, epitopening, functional assays, and the production of recombinant proteins and plasmids. With over two decades of experience, um, we have achieved uh, success across a wide range of targets. Um, We've successfully completed over 3,600 projects, um, even against challenging targets such as GPCRs and multi-transmembrane spanning proteins. Uh, our immunization technique has proven itself and we are able to identify highly specific antibodies um, <clears throat> recognizing conformational epitopes. To address target homology concerns, uh, we've integrated various species in our advanced platforms. To fit the licensing preferences of our clients, um, we have a huge focus on developing our single cell technologies with all the transgenic animal platforms. So we offer immunization and screening of wild type and transgenic mice um, for the generation of human, but also llama antibodies as well as rats, rabbits, alpacas, and um, we can also do screening on human PBMCs from convalescent patients. Combining uh, these species with 
multiple antigen farmers is critical to customize our immunization strategy specifically for each target. So to access antibodies against native epitopes, we offer DNA and mRNA immunization in all species. Um, and then also besides protein and peptide, um, we have alternative options such as VLPs, nanodisks and cells that can be requested for immunization. Genovac's genetic immunization of animals um, from different species uh, plays a pivotal role in discovering antibodies against complex multi-transmembrane, um, but also multi-subunit targets. So genetic immunization offers great flexibility in antigen design, enabling the generation of antibodies against native conformational epitopes, which is actually um, a, quite, a crucial factor for therapeutic antibody discovery. And it also allows us to design vectors that break tolerance um, in case of high homology um, without actually the need of time-consuming antigen production. However, whenever there is protein available and accessible, um, incorporating cost-effective DNA immunization offers the advantage um, of broadening the diversity within the candidate pool. But now it's enough about the company. Let's focus on, on our case study in which we successfully generated anti it antibodies against two antibodies, which are current therapeutic lead candidates from an earlier discovery campaign from our side. Um, so the entire story started with the discovery of antibodies against a type 1 membrane protein, which um, is implicated in the LDL metabolism and atherosclerosis. We have uh, identified multiple antibodies in OmniRats using our genetic immunization technology and um, the hybridoma platform back then. Uh, upon characterization of these antibodies, we have identified two lead candidates that bind and block the biological function of that protein. Uh, our partner is still conducting experiments and they are in the final stages of deciding with which antibody they want to go further. Um, for the characterization of those lead candidates, they need to conduct PK, PD studies, for which high affinity anti-idiotype antibodies are required. So with that said, um, we decided to start campaigns for the discovery of anti antibodies against the type 1 membrane protein. And since starting campaigns against two lead candidates in comparison to one does not add significant costs and time, and, and, and time was important, um, we elected to generate anti-ID antibodies against both lead candidates. Um, so now in the following, um, we'll call the lead candidates LC1 for lead candidate 1 and LC2 for lead candidate 2. For the discovery of our anti-ID antibodies, we initiated multiple campaigns. Um, we wanted to compare the different immunization techniques in regard of the recovered hits. So uh, questions we wanted to address were, for example, which immunization strategy yields high affinity hits? Uh, which strategy offers a more di diverse sequence repertoire overall? Um, which immunization technique is actually adequate for the discovery of anti its And so with that said, um, we, um, we did three different immunization strategies. Um, one immunization strategy was the protein immunization, where we co-immunized both lead candidates, so LC1 and LC2, in a human red chimeric format. The timeline is very short. Um, however, one drawback is the long production time of the immunogen. So simultaneously, a second campaign was started in which we used our standard genetic immunization technique. Um, we engineered a plasmid encoding the single chain variable fragment of either LC1 or LC2. The immunization time in comparison to the protein immunization um, is 
slightly longer. Uh, however, uh, the production timeline for the immunogen is very fast. And lastly, a third immunization technique was used. Um, it actually doesn't really differ dramatically from the genetic immunization protocol one. However, um, this protocol is a more flexible protocol um, and it adapts very easily to the tighter development of the anti animals. Um, so this is actually the only big difference um, because here again we immunized with the same plasmids um, encoding the single chain variable fragments for again either LC1 or LC2. This slide summarizes again the five different immunization strategies we went with. So um, for genetic immunization strategies, um, two protocol one, two protocol two, and then one protein immunization strategy. Uh, since our target antibody for the protein immunization was in a rat backbone, we immunized wild type rats to generate antibodies um, only against the variable fragments um, of the lead candidates. On the right hand side, uh, you can see the last titer measurements um, prior to harvest. Even though the time, the, the immunization timelines, um, they differed. Um, but what you can see here is that all five immunization techniques yielded high titers. The immunization of, rat, of the rats was only one part of the campaign. The second part now um, was the discovery of our anti-id antibodies, which includes the screening and the downstream characterization. So for the discovery of our anti-id antibodies, we used the beacon system from PhenomeX. Um, the beacon system enables the screening of thousands of plasma cells at extremely high monoclonality for their specificity. So a big advantage is that we keep with this method the information of native heavy and light chain pairing. And uh, we are offering two beacons which can be operated side by side for just one campaign, enabling the screening of up to 80,000 plasma cells in just one day. We can do a more thorough characterization of antibodies by performing a series of sequential assays, um, helping to identify the antibody of interest and limit the downstream molecular biology work. So, for example, um, cross reactivity studies can be carried out on the beacon by just sequentially testing on different target orthologs um, and thereby getting to the right antibody faster. For these assays, uh, we have multiple reagents in place, um, such as transiently transfected cells, cell lines, um, protein or nano disc coupled beads. And our current available workflow enables sequence recovery and re-expression in two to four weeks. So I'd like to quickly point out how we screen the plasma cells on the beacon. Um, so the beacon enables screening on single cell basis using microfluidics um, and optoelectric positioning for single cell cloning. Um, so we pre-enriched um, antibody secreting cells, which are then loaded onto a so-called optoselect 11K chip that consists of 11K of 11,000 so-called nanopens. Um, once an antibody producing cell uh, secretes a specific primary antibody, this one will bind to the screening reagents in the channel. And in our case, we used fully human um, LC1 or LC2 antibodies, which were coupled on beads, as you can see here in this uh, little graphic. We then added a secondary fluorescently labeled species specific antibody that binds to our specific anti-id antibody that accumulates around the beat and that induces a fluorescent signal. Um, these so-called blooms identify antibody secreting cells that secrete target specific antibodies and these candidates of interest are single cell exported and cloned for recombinant expression and characterization. 
Our screening employed two to four 11K uh, to select chips per campaign. On the left side, you can see the percentage of specific hits per screened plasma cells. The percentages uh, vary from around 1.5% to 5.9%, with the percentages for protein immunization the highest, actually. Um, typically, what we've seen is that these percentages are normally in the range of 0.1% to 1%, so depending, of course, um, heavily on the target, the species, and generally the campaign. So overall, what I want to say with that is that our immunization strategies, um, with them, we were able to identify a lot of hits on the beacon, and these percentages are actually quite good. Um, with the protein immunization, we identified the most hits. Uh, this is actually not really surprising, since with this strategy, the immunogen is present, presented more abundantly than in, with the genetic immunization. Um, however, when we did the further characterization, a lot of these identified hits coming from the protein immunization seemed to react to other human IgGs, so they actually showed unspecific binding. Uh, we selected a representative number of hits for further downstream analysis, um, as you can see here on the right-hand side. We first looked at diversity um, in the different sequence pools coming from the different immunization strategies. For that, we categorized our sequences into clonotypes. So whenever I'm talking about clonotypes, what I mean by that is that they have the same predicted vari variable and joining segment for the heavy chain on germline level. On the left-hand side, you can see a Venn diagram depicting overlapping clonotypes for LC1, and on the right-hand side, the one for LC2. Overall, we observed little to no overlap between all three immunization strategies. Uh, meaning that uh, we achieve a quite different pool of sequences, actually, with each campaign. The highest amount of clonotypes um, was achieved for the advanced genetic immunization, um, so with the um, genetic immunization protocol 2 for both lead candidates. So taken together, combining protein with genetic immunization leads to the largest diversity, actually. To, we wanted also to access um, diversity in a more comprehensive way, so that is why we wanted to add a measurement on how diverse these antibodies actually are. And for that, we used the Renyi formula. It, uh, it, it quantifies the diversity uh, or the randomness of a system, taking into account the evenness, so if there is any clonal dominance in the system, uh, and on the richness, which means the number of unique sequences. These values were obtained with the software from the IGX Explore app from NPCOM. High Renyi numbers indicate low clonal dominance and high number of unique sequences. So generally, the higher the value you obtain, the more diverse is your system. Across our immunization strategies, antibodies identified through the Genetic Immunization Protocol 2 exhibited the highest diversity for both lead candidates. And in the case of lead candidate 1, both genetic immunizations surpassed the protein immunization in regard of diversity. Having the most clonotypes and the highest value in regard of diversity, the Genetic Immunization Protocol 2 really actually stands out. But now I would like to give you a better visual representation. And so for that, we have generated a phylogenetic tree for the sequences obtained from the different immunization strategies. So um, here on this phylogenetic tree, you can see the sequences uh, we've obtained with the protein immunization. And generally having a protein available offers you a fast and easy way of generating a panel of antibodies. 
However, when adding uh, to this uh, to the antibodies, other antibodies coming from the genetic immunization, um, it actually offers you a even broader pool of antibodies with which we can increase sequence diversity and we are able to find the right antibodies. So on this tree, you can see some branches which are only available due to one or the other immunization strategy. And uh, running multiple immunization strategies results in the highest sequence diverse diversity. But we not only looked at the sequence level, of course, um, but also conducted tests to identify binding specificity for uh, LC1 or LC2. And for that, we performed an ELISA on seven different entities. We tested our antibodies on fully human IgG, fully human FAP fragments, um, in presence of human serum and without human serum, um, and on polyhuman IgG. Um, the entity with human serum, uh, what we wanted to see is if there are other antibodies in the human serum that actually block the binding of the FAP fragment with our antibody. We observed different binding patterns across all three immunization strategies. And in this table, which you can see here on the slide, um, you can see a representative data set. So of course we have screened all the antibodies and this is just an example out of it. Uh, we found specific antibodies for lead candidate one, as well as for lead candidate two. Um, but we also have identified anti antibodies um, binding um, unspecifically to the polyhuman IgG. Uh, this data indicates very well um, whenever antibodies um, are bound, binding um, to antibodies present in the human serum and are hence unspecific. So this I think you can um, see very well um, in, in the last 3M antibody uh, data set. Interestingly, when we looked at percentage of specific binders from the different immunization strategies, we detected most um, of specific, most specific binders from the advanced genetic immunization, so the genetic immunization protocol too. Overall, however, the discovery of anti-ID antibodies was across all three strategies very successful and we were able to identify a broad pool of antibodies. Um, so now to further characterize these antibodies, um, we investigated binding kinetics and affinity measurements. And with that, I will hand over to Donovan. Thank you, Amelie. Following the work that Amelie has just described, I will move to the characterization work of the anti-ID antibodies using the Gator Plus BioLayer Interferometry Instrument from Gator Bio. With approximately 100 antibodies between lead candidate one and two, the first step was to down select, ensuring we could focus on the most diverse and highest affinity candidates. This was done by pulling together both approximate KD values collected from the affinity ranking, as well as their locations on the phylogenetic trees. With both the full length IgG and the FAB fragment produced for both lead candidate one and lead candidate two, we had a decision to make as to which to use for our antigen. For the most robust affinity results, it was best to use the monovalent FAB fragment as it minimizes the potential avidity effects present when using a bivalent antigen and a bivalent ligand. We used GatorBio's new novel SAXT probes, giving us a three-fold signal increase compared to standard streptavidin probes. The surface of the SAXT probes were prepared with a GOAT anti-rat FC surface. The initial affinity ranking experiment ran two concentrations of the FAB fragments, testing lead candidate one and lead candidate two against all antibodies. This data was then grouped by binding pair and fit using global unlinked. The scatter plot condenses our results showing apparent KD values for our anti-ID antibodies, binding to lead candidate one and lead candidate two. The therapeutic antibodies are categorized by immunization technique, and the median KD value is represented by the black horizontal bar. KD values for lead candidate one range from 100 nanomolar to 100 picomolar, 
while the KD values for early candidate two range from 100 nanomolar to 10 picomolar. Overall, genetic immunization resulted in the largest number of high affinity antibodies. However, protein immunization also generated high affinity antibodies, including one with picomolar affinity. Compared to lead candidate one, we recovered a greater number of high affinity antibodies for lead candidate two. When generating anti id antibodies, high affinity is the goal. By using both genetic and protein immunization, we are able to increase the overall success rate of the project. Lead candidate one anti id antibodies were selected for high resolution kinetics based on ELISA specificity data and affinity ranking. The top four shown here being a product of genetic immunization, the genet with the genetic immunization protocol two generating the highest affinity antibodies. All four antibodies did not show any cross reactivity to lead candidate two or polyhuman IgG in the ELISA, but did show tight binding to the lead candidate one fab fragment in the affinity ranking experiment. The high resolution kinetics use the same experiment design as the, high, as the affinity ranking experiment, except the antibodies were tested against eight lead candidate fab fragment concentrations. For high resolution kinetics, the antibodies were grouped by ligand name and fit using global unlinked. The same parameters as a lead candidate one were used to down select. Here, I'm showing the data for the top six antibodies. These antibodies again did not show any cross reactivity in the ELISA, but have the tightest binding to the lead candidate two fab fragment in the ranking experiment. Like lead candidate one, the lead candidate two high resolution kinetics is the same experiment design as the affinity ranking, but tested eight antigen concentrations. The affinity values range from high to low picomolar as seen in the table. However, some of these values are listed as less than 10 picomolar. A precise value was unable to be determined in global unlinked fit due to the off rate being too slow. This gave a KD value listed as out of range on instrument. The majority of the lead candidate two antibodies did come from genetic immunization protocols. However, two resulted from the protein immunization, with one candidate having a sub 10 picomolar affinity. This reinforces the idea that the best way to generate high affinity anti-ID antibodies is by running both protein and genetic immunization. Our immunization strategy used only the antibody drug formatted as an SCFV, so we can expect no type 3 antibodies to be present. To categorize the lead candidate 1 and lead candidate 2 anti id antibodies, we executed a premix binding competition experiment. The same antibodies used for the high resolution kinetics were selected for this experiment and captured onto the SAXT probes containing the biotin anti rat FC surface. Probes are then dipped into the premix containing the corresponding fab fragment in the protein. To ensure no free fab fragment is in solution, the target protein is added at a three-fold molar excess. If the anti-id antibody is a type one, it can only detect free antibody drug. We can expect no shift in signal as the complex cannot bind. Type two does not compete and detects both free and bound antibody. So here we can expect a shift in signal. Sensogram show representative data for lead candidate two competition assay, where four anti id antibodies show clear non blocking behavior, represented by a shift greater than 0 0.25. The two falling below the 0 0.25 cutoff represent blockers. We are seeing a signal increase here. However, this is not indicative of non blocking. The affinity of the target protein fab fragment complex is weaker than that of the fab fragment anti id antibody. What we are seeing here is dissociation of the fab fragment from the target protein and binding to the captured antibodies. The molecular weight of the fab fragment is less than that of the complex, so that gives us a lower maximum shift. The bars below rep show representative data for both lead candidate one and lead candidate two, where the green represents a type two anti-id and the red represents a type one. For anti-ID antibody production, we see high affinity antibodies for both genetic and protein immunization. Having the ability to throw genetic immunization into the pool with protein immunization allows for us to generate a greater number of high affinity hits. Using the Gayer Bios BLI instrumentation, we're able to characterize at various stages in the production process. Having the ability to run clarified supernatant and purified antibody, 
we can down select and provide robust characterization results for our client. Before I open it up to questions, I'd like to thank the rest of the team that Amelie and I have been working with to generate the data as well as the antibodies. This would not have been possible without the great team that we have here at Genevac. Thank you everyone for listening to our presentation. I will now give it back to Gator Bile to fire any questions you have our way. Thank you.